What up? Welcome back to Sam Dunks, the weekly NBA coverage for Slab Stocks. You can follow us on Instagram at Slab Stocks. You can follow me on Instagram at Slab Stocks Sam. It's a tough time to know how to handle anything really with all of the COVID-19 stuff going on, but at least when it comes to your car and investments, we've got you covered. So please follow Slab Stocks on Instagram, go to slabstocks.com and put your email in there for some regular emails with really good information and with deals delivered straight to your inbox. If you're new to the show, I usually cover the past week of NBA action, but obviously without any NBA action going on, it's kind of hard to do that. So today, instead of that, I'm going to cover five players that I think would stand to gain the most value if the NBA playoffs were to resume today. Before we get to that, let's first talk about the biggest news in the league recently. That would be the Michael Jordan documentary. Uh, just aired last night on ESPN. The first two episodes, uh, The Last Dance is what it's called. The first two episodes aired. Really good stuff. I'm only 27 years old, so I was six or seven years old when the Last Dance season was going on. And I had a vague idea of what was going on, but I kind of missed most of that. So if you're around my age or younger, I would encourage you to watch the the documentary. Uh, really excellent information and tons of footage of Michael Jordan in his prime uh, that you probably won't get to see anywhere else. So I would encourage you to go watch that. Speaking of the Chicago Bulls, the other biggest news in the NBA recently, you've probably seen it by now, the Bulls finally fired their, their GM, Gar Foreman. They moved John Paxton into an advisory role at the organization, paving the way for new vice president of basketball operations, Arturis Kornisovas, to reshape the Bulls. If you've listened to my show before, you know that I've ragged on the Bulls quite a bit, and usually not because of the actual players, mostly because of the asinine decision-making of the Bulls' front office. I said that until they make some changes at the top, you'd better stay away from all of the young Bulls. Finally, the day has come. They've made the changes, and we can celebrate. At Karnasovas, he's still looking for a GM, but once that happens, I think the next domino will be moving on from Jim Boylan. Uh, Joy Jim Boylan. Jim Boylan. An idiot, though. Uh, that, that will really have things looking up for Chicago Bulls. I really don't think they're going to be a free agent destination anytime soon, which is fine because it will just leave more room for guys like Kobe White and Wendell Carter and Laurie Markkinen to really start improving. You know, the Bulls have operated without any sense of de direction for the past number of years, which is not going to play well for the development of these young guys. In fact, we've already seen that negative development take place with Wendell Carter and Laurie Markkinen. Uh, but Karnasovas and the new GM and hopefully a new coach, they should really provide the direction for this young team, uh, not to mention some general intelligence in how to play. And I think the future is now looking brighter for each of these young guys, especially Kobe White, who I do like and I do think has a chance to be a pretty good player. I was just really worried about his development before, but I'm significantly less worried now. I would be using this offseason to buy into Kobe White if you don't already have a position on him. Okay, let's move on to the main topic for this podcast. I am going to be touching on five players whose card market would benefit the most if the playoffs were to start today. I really don't think the playoffs are going to be starting anytime soon, if at all, which as a Bucks fan is just about the most painful thing I can think of. But that's just what happens sometimes. So let's get started. Imagining the playoffs were going to start today. I don't really just want to go with the obvious guys through these these five players, um, but I will start with probably the most obvious player, and that would be Jason Tatum. And Tatum's seen this astronomic rise over the course of the season, both in reputation and in card value, uh, using his PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie card as the baseline for this conversation. He has seen an incredible 258% increase over the course of the season. That has cooled a bit since the season was suspended as PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookies are currently auctioning off around $900. Uh, he's really made a leap this year uh, and should be one of the premier two-way wings moving forward in the league. And his first round matchup would come against the reeling Philadelphia 76ers. And while the Celtics are only 1-3 and three against the Sixers this year and in those games Tatum has averaged only 19 points, 6.5 rebounds and 3.5 assists that being said, his most frequent defender in those games was Ben Simmons, who is a terrific defensive player and who held Tatum to only 31% from the field over 90 possessions in those games. 
We don't know about the status of Ben Simmons. He did have a pinched nerve in his back the last we heard, and the information hasn't changed in the time since. There was speculation that he could be out for the year, and that would help Tatum's case in the playoffs. As the Sixers have kind of become a dumpster fire as the season's gone on, I think the Celtics can win this matchup pretty easily. And if that were the case, it would likely be on the back of some pretty excellent performances as Tatum continues his breakout campaign. And I would expect a healthy rise in his market. So that's the first player. Second player, another obvious pick, but I really can't ignore him for this exercise, the young Ja Morant. There's really not much to say about Ja that hasn't already been said. He's had an incredible rookie campaign. He will win Rookie of the Year over Zion, basically just due to games played. Uh, he's just really good on both sides of the ball, and he's one of the more eye-popping and exciting players in the league to watch as well. Ever since the season was suspended, his cards are still selling like crazy on eBay, and his base Prism PSA 10 rookie cards are auctioning over $300, which, even, which isn't even a discount since the middle of March. He's still trading right around the same spot as he was when the season was suspended, which is probably the best case we can hope for if we're looking to get a discount. I think the biggest form of a discount we're going to get from him is just a period of time where his cards plateau and don't increase at all. We're probably not going to ever see a big drop, so this might be a good buying opportunity for you. Uh, his first round matchup would be against the Los Angeles Lakers, which would really be the best thing possible for a quick rise in value. Would the Grizzlies win? No, not even probably a game. But on the biggest stage against the most recognizable face in sport, Ja Morant would be putting up some real highlight level footage, uh, getting extra publicity for seven games. Well, probably four games to be fair, but four games in a row against the LA Lakers, that's really going to put a fire under his card market. And he's played really well against the Lakers in this season. Now, four games against them, 21.5 points, 3.3 rebounds, 6 and a third assists, 2 steals, shooting 525 from the field and 545 from 3. Just incredible performances. On top of that, You'd have the LeBron post-game press conferences where he's coming off a big win, he's being asked about the young point guard on the other team, and you better believe that LeBron is going to be talking him up because that's what LeBron does for the young guys, especially the young guys that he just beat. I think it all adds up to some pretty nice gains for the young point guard from Memphis. Another young guard that I want to talk about, Shea Gilgis-Alexander. If the playoffs were to start today, we would see the Oklahoma City Thunder facing up against the Utah Jazz, and this would be a juicy matchup. You might remember the last time these two teams faced, they actually didn't even play a single minute because that was the game which caused the cancellation of the NBA. So as fate would have it, the very next time they would meet would be the first round of the playoffs, and you got to love it. I actually have chosen two players from this matchup. Uh, the first, as I said, is Shea Gilgis-Alexander. He's played... Uh, the Jazz twice this season in those games. He's averaged 23 points, 4 rebounds, 2 assists, and a steal and a half. By the end of November, the Thunder were sitting on a 7-11 and record. Really bad. Uh, they were playing like a bunch of players on a new team that didn't have any expectations of contending. Well, maybe you're doing the math now, but that means that they ended the season 40-24, and so they went 33-13 and over the next three-ish months. Uh, SGA was remarkably consistent statistically during that period of time, uh, but the team was obviously playing much better as the team began to mesh together around him. If SGA were being guarded by Donovan Mitchell in this imaginary matchup, it would be an excellent opportunity for him to really blow up, as Mitchell's just not very good on that side of the ball. Unfortunately, the Jazz don't play Mitchell on him, really. They put Royce O'Neal on him in most of their matchups, and Royce O'Neal is usually the one that's guarding the opposing team's best player, which is a good sign for SGA's reputation, but it doesn't really help him offensively. Even so, he has played well against the Jazz, even being covered by a good defender like Royce O'Neal. So just looking at Shea's Prism Silver PSA 10 market, his most recent auctions come in at an average of $275, which is up roughly 80% over the course of the season, although it is a down about 11% since the beginning of the shutdown. Uh, Shea was 6th in Rookie of the Year voting last year, behind Luca, Trey, Ayton, Triple J, and Colin Sexton, which is just preposterous, by the way. Uh, there's a really good chance that he's actually the third best player in this draft moving forward, and he probably actually already is the third best, to be honest. And I think it's only a matter of time before he makes the leap in the public eye from a promising young player to just a good all-around player. And so, 
Uh, the biggest reason for Shea to gain in the playoffs would simply be exposure. And even though I think the whole Jazz, on the whole, the Jazz might be a little bit better than the Thunder, I think the Thunder do have a good chance of playing upset in this matchup. And very few teams have been playing hotter than them, and they have uh, a bit better veteran presence on the team with Danilo Gallinari and CP3. And if that's the case and the Thunder get out of the first round, the national exposure for a young player like Shea can really pump up his card market in a hurry. Uh, going to the other side of the court in this pretend matchup, another player I have as a big winner if the playoffs started today is Donovan Mitchell. Third-year player, first-time All-Star this year. Uh, he's been very consistent so far in his career, and this year he's averaging 24 points, 4.4 rebounds, and just over four assists and a steal per game, shooting 45% from the field and uh, just 36% from three, but pretty good. Uh, looking again solely at his Prism Silver PSA 10 rookie cards, uh, just as our baseline, he's not seen an increase over the season. Actually, the first two auctions to start out the year in October went for an average of three seventy-three and fifty cents. His most recent auction closed at two seventy, which is a loss of twenty-seven percent. Uh, even before the season was suspended, the same cards were auctioning around three thirty-five, which is still a ten percent drop. There are reasons for this. The Jazz have been somewhat of a disappointment this year. You know, they went out in the off season looking to make that last step. They picked up Mike Conley. Turns out he's kind of a shell of his former self. Uh, they started scuffling down the stretch, while a 41-23 and 23 record in the West is really nothing to sneeze at. Uh, they were being spoken as a dark horse finals candidates in the offseason. And it just didn't work out that way for them this year. And I don't think anyone expects them to make it to the finals anymore. Not this year, anyways. So perhaps they're just a victim of high expectations. A full game up on the Thunder, but the Thunder are the exciting surprise team, and the Jazz are the disappointment. That's just how it works with the NBA being such a big uh, narrative-driven product. Uh, so that's probably been the driver of Donovan Mitchell's loss of value over the course of the season. Uh, but I think he is primed to reclaim some of the value if the playoffs were to begin today. In my mind... The number one reason for this would be the current fiasco going on with Rudy Gobert. You probably all know by now Gobert was the first player to test positive for coronavirus in the league. Uh, he tested positive after joking with a bunch of reporters, touching their mics and whatnot. Apparently also he was going around the locker room and making a joke about it before this positive test. I'm not ragging on him. To be fair, many people were joking about it back at the beginning of March. But soon after his positive test, Donovan Mitchell tested positive as well, and the word out of Utah is that the relationship between those two has soured, and that these two franchise cornerstones just really can't reconcile for whatever reason. Uh, they're probably going to be looking to move forward from move on from Gobert because of it. Just looking at this like any normal human being, if I had a coworker who tested positive for coronavirus, and a day later I did as well, I don't think I'd be too quick to throw that guy under the bus because it's really just as likely that I contracted the virus first and passed it on to him. And if somehow that co-worker was world famous and was getting absolutely schmacked by the media, and perhaps I was the one that passed it on to him in the first place, I like to think that I would be out there in the media telling people to ease off of him. And that's just not what has been happening with the Utah Jazz. You know, Spida Mitchell, he's had a totally different response. You know, maybe I'm reading the tea leaves here, but I don't think the anger out of the Mitchell camp is really related to COVID-19. I think this is a gambit for him to claim the team for himself, which I'm not opposed to him doing because I think he's better than Gobert. And I think if this team's ever going to reach its peak, it's probably not going to be with Gobert plugging up the middle. I really do believe that Mitchell looks at some of the other tandems around the league and senses that the Jazz tandem kind of ranks pretty low comparatively, and he's hoping to get a better partner moving forward. Uh, and you can't normally just make trade demands for your teammates without looking like a total jerk. So I think he's sort of latched onto this narrative and is spinning it so that he can get his way and still look like a victim in all of this and keep his good name and reputation. This can't be disproved since the playoffs won't happen, but I would be very willing to bet that Mitchell would use this playoffs to showcase his ability and to send the message that he really doesn't need Gobert around. And that's all it really takes for some nice gains in the playoffs is a, a couple of big scoring performances. With that, he'd really solidify his, wa his waning card market and then some, and I like him quite a bit moving forward. Uh, the last player I want to talk about, just going to have a bit of fun with this one. One of my favorite players in the league for my Milwaukee Bucks, second-year guard Dante DiVincenzo. 
Uh, he's been somewhat of an under-the-radar under player in the league uh, thus far, uh, but he's really been quite exciting. You know, he's the type of high-energy, high-flying, instinctive player that doesn't necessarily put up the huge counting stats, but when you're watching the Bucks, you really certainly notice him quite frequently. Assuming the Bucks made a deep run in the playoffs and the big Ragu continued doing the things that he's been doing all season, there is no reason that he wouldn't see at least a modest increase in value. As PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie cards are only auctioning in about the mid-60s or so, so clearly not a hugely sought-after card on the market, but I think that puts him at a nice spot for some potential upside. He's likely going to be the Bucks' starting shooting guard next season, and assuming the high-flying acrobatics in, in these imaginary playoffs that we're talking about with the entire NBA watching, we should see that card rise into the triple digits relatively soon. All right, those are my five guys. I would like to hear what you think. If you have any other players that you think would increase in value, supposing the playoffs were to start today, uh, comment on YouTube, send out a tweet, or a tweet, send out a message on Instagram, uh, get the word out. I'd love to start the conversation with you. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Slab Stocks on Instagram. Follow me as well, and put your email in the slabstocks.com uh, little top bar and get some deals delivered straight to you. All right, thanks for your time.